Hello and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. This is the third in my three-part series ranking my favorite Wheel of Time books. If you haven't already watched the first two videos in the series, make sure you check those out. Uh, in this video, we're going to examine my top five favorite books. As I mentioned in the last video, if you don't already have all of the Wheel of Time audiobooks, I highly recommend taking advantage of the offer that Audible.com is giving my viewers. You can receive a free audiobook just for signing up for a free trial with Audible. You don't have to commit, you don't have to pay a dime, and you get to keep your audiobook even if you choose not to keep the trial. If you do decide to keep it, you're going to get a new audiobook every month and it only costs you 15 bucks. It's a really awesome deal and I highly recommend the audiobooks uh, for especially for Wheel of Time. Michael Kramer and Kate Redding are awesome. I have all of the Wheel of Time series as well as a number of other books in business development and fiction. I just love it. Uh, you can get access by going to www.audibletrial.com forward slash Nabless. I'll have a link in the description below. Guys, just by signing up for this, you are really helping out the channel. So we'll go ahead and dive right in here. We're going to throw up a spoiler rating for this video. This video is going to carry a spoiler rating of red, meaning I will be mentioning and discussing events and characters all the way through the final book, A Memory of Light. So if you've not finished the series, you may want to avoid this video. I'm not going to be going into super deep detail with all of the plot points, but I am going to mention things and I might spoil some stuff. Watch at your own risk. Uh, quick recap for my ranking system for these books. If you want the full description on all the how the rankings work, go ahead and watch the first video and the second video, but here's my quick recap. I have five separate factors in ranking the books. Each of the factors will be ranked on a scale of 1 to 10, meaning the books will get a total score out of 50. The factors are pacing, interest to the reader, character development, world building, and plot resolution and big moments. So let's go ahead and dive into my top five favorite books from The Wheel of Time, starting with number five. <laughs> Slightly edging out The Dragon Reborn, at least in my own head, uh, is the second book in the series, The Great Hunt. The Great Hunt is really what got me absolutely hooked on this series. It, it's an amazing follow-up to The Eye of the World, and it really drives the story deeply and just kind of hooks you. So The Great Hunt is an absolute straight-up roller coaster ride. The pacing is amazing from start to finish, and the plots kind of all weave together to produce a really powerful ending when they all meet at FOMA. It's really a masterpiece in pacing. It has you on the edge of the seat from the start to the finish. Great Hunt gets a 10 out of 10 for pacing. As interest to the reader goes, the hunt for the horn and the chase are really quite interesting, although the politics of Kyrian are not super interesting to me. I was also not a real big fan of the Portal Stone world part of the book, but the ending is absolutely amazing, and learning about the White Tower after hearing about it through the first book is also super interesting. Overall, The Great Hunt gets an 8 out of 10 for interest for me. For character development, we get to see Rand develop into a leader, as he also struggles with being a man that can channel in a world that hates men that can channel. He also fights what he believes to be of the schemes of Aes Sedai, and we see a lot of the person that Rand will, will become take hold in the Great Hunt. His leadership development, uh, his power to influence other people really begins here. For character development, The Great Hunt gets a 7 out of 10. For world building, the book is packed cover to cover with world building material. We meet the Shan Chan, see Kyrian, see the Portal Stones, see the White Tower. We get to see Terabon, and we continue learning about all of the areas that we knew of from the Eye of the World. The Great Hunt easily takes a 10 out of 10 for world building. For big moments and plot resolution, The Great Hunt is amazing. The plot builds to the ending so nicely, and the ending is so epic and defines the future books and the future for the characters in the world. From the blowing of the Horn of Valir, to Rand fighting Ishamael in the sky, and the battle between the White Cloaks and the Shan Chan, the ending is just so incredibly epic. The Great Hunt gets a 10 out of 10 for big moments and resolution. In total, The Great Hunt gets a 45 out of 50 and earns the number 5 spot on my list. <music> Towers of Midnight is the second to last book in the series and serves to wrap up most of the extraneous plots so that Tarman Gaiden can commence. The pacing of Towers of Midnight is almost perfect. The book starts off with an amazing scene between Rand and Egwene, and it just moves so well from there as we see plot after plot get resolved in this book. 10 out of 10 for pacing. For interest, seeing Zen Rand out righting all of his wrongs and Matt's rescue of Moraine are just really fun. 
I wouldn't quite say the book is as interesting as the book before it or the one after it, but still it's really interesting. 9 out of 10 for interest to the reader. For character development, we get to see Rand fully realized as, again, Zen Rand. And while he's not necessarily developing further, we are learning more about who he is now. Avienda and her trip to Roideon and the discoveries about the future of the Aiel give us more insight into her character as well as that of the Aiel. We see Matt continue to sacrifice himself, despite not really admitting that, that he's always putting himself before others as he saves Moraine. For character development, Towers of Midnight gets a 9 out of 10. For world building, we see if we see the world of the Finns in more depth. We get to see Rand establish order in Eridaman. We see the various female channeler societies come together. There is little that we can learn about the world at this point, you would think, but we seem to continually be able to drive depth into the characters and then the world that we're in. 8 out of 10 for world building. And lastly, for plot resolution and big moments, we have quite a bit in this book. Perrin gets resolution with the White Cloaks. Masana is unmasked in the White Tower. Rand annihilates an entire army all by himself. We see Rand and Egwene reunited, even though it is in conflict. We see Moraine rescued. We see the Golom defeated. This book is full of resolution, as it really sets the stage for the last battle. 10 out of 10 for plot resolution and big moments. In total, Towers of Midnight gets a 46 out of 50 and earns the number 3 spot on our list. <laughs> The Gathering Storm is the first book that Brandon Sanderson wrote, and while you can see the difference in some of the characters, particularly Matt, he did an amazing job with the story. With pacing, one of Sanderson's strengths in his own novels is pacing and keeping the action coming. He tends to write in a more cinematic fashion, and you can really see that in this book. The Gathering Storm seems like one major event after another, and it is much faster moving than the previous books to this point in the series. The Gathering Storm gets a 10 out of 10 for pacing. With interest to the reader, we see Ran go fully mad and almost kind of evil. Uh, we see his meeting with the actual Daughter of Nine Moons and the aftermath of that meeting. Uh, we see Egwene slowly taking over the tower from within through the force of her will and leadership skills. And the final unmasking of the Black Aja and Varen's big reveal are super interesting points and it was really kind of a joy to read. 9 out of 10 for interest to the reader. As character development goes, it's hard to beat this book. Egwene's development as a leader with no power and her influence over others based on who she is but not the position that she holds, that could be a whole video of its own. But Rand really steals the show here. His internal struggle and the darkness and hopelessness that he feels provides a really strong contrast to the, the Rand that we see after the Dragon Mount Epiphany. This is very well executed. The only knock on the character development here is the poor job that Sanderson did with Matt in this book. And he'll admit to that. I'm not one to criticize Brandon Sanderson as we wouldn't even have a finished series without him. And although his style is different, he did an absolutely amazing job finishing the series. Despite his admitted struggle with writing Matt in this book, I'm going to give the book a 10 out of 10 for character development based on the Rand and Egwene developments alone. For world building, we don't get much new here in terms of new parts of the world other than some time spent in Eridaman. But at this point in the series, not much new is being introduced in terms of lands or places, but the depth is always something that is being added. We do see more of Eridaman as Rand tries to bring order and as he searches for Grendel. We see more of the tower politics and the time in the White Tower is almost half the book. Uh, so we get to learn a lot more about the White Tower. We also get some backstory to the concept of rebirth and the cyclical nature of time that is a major part of the Wheel of Time world as Rand finally joins with Luz Theron at the end of the book. For world building, Gathering Storm gets an 8 out of 10. For plot resolution and big moments, this book is full of them. Varen's big reveal is just amazing, straight up. Uh, Rand's internal conflict and the devious destruction of Grendel's hideout are, are resolved nicely in the veins of Gold Chapter at the end of the book as we see him finally come to terms with his insanity and become who he should be in, in the dragon. Egwene's heroism and becoming a force of nature as she embodies what the White Tower itself should stand for and repels the Shanchan and leads the tower to defend itself even as a novice. The reunification of the tower and the end of the tower split plot also add to this book's huge moments. 10 out of 10 for plot resolution and big moments. In total, The Gathering Storm gets a 47 out of 50 and earns the number 3 spot on my list. 
So we're down to our top two and coming in at the number two spot, the final book in the series, A Memory of Light. So in my mind, this book was a near perfect ending to a masterpiece of a fantasy series. I don't agree with everything in the book, but I love how it was executed. The only area I really give the novel some criticism is in its pacing. I'm not sure there was a way to get around this, but the book is essentially one large battle with us popping from battlefield to battlefield. Uh, and there were times it just didn't feel it was real consistent in its pacing. It's not that there were any dull moments, but it just felt like there were no real moments to catch your breath, I should say. For me, this means the book gets an 8 out of 10 for pacing. In interest to the reader, I'm not sure how this book could be any more interesting. Simply having the end of the story that lasted 14 previous books to this book, simply having the ending of a 15 book series contained in it gives this book enough to get a 10 out of 10 here. But the number of interesting characters and plots that are jam packed into the novel is just nuts. 10 out of 10 for interest to the reader. So for character development, many of our characters are fully developed at this point, but we still see Matt shine as he kind of takes over the forces of the light. We see Egwene leading the White Tower into war. We see Rand being Rand. But the most interesting character that gets developed to me in this book is that of the Dark One. We actually get to see the Dark One as more of the real entity that he is, and we learn more about what drives him, and he's really just a counter to the creator. We sort of demystify the Dark One, and we learn a little bit about the personality there. And then also we get to see, we finally get to see Demon Dread in action, and see a little bit more development of his character, and a little bit more of his backstory. 10 out of 10 for character development. For world building, again, this is just crazy good. We finally see the Shard and learn about them as they join the battle. We see Sheogul in the Valley of Thakandar. We see the prophecies of the dragon and the prophecies of the Shanjin and the Sea Folk and all of the other prophecies kind of come to fruition. Um, and we get also to see a plan of what the world is going to look like after the forces of light are victorious. So it, again, it's setting up world building for even when the novel is over. This is the world that Robert Jordan had created fully formed at this point. 10 out of 10 for world building. Lastly, for big moments and plot resolution, I don't know how the moments could get any bigger or the plot be more resolved than the final book of a 15 book saga. Brandon Sanderson and Robert Jordan did such a great job of wrapping up all of the loose threads and giving us an amazing final product, while still leaving us some wonder about the world to be and some things to speculate on about what happens after the books. Easy 10 out of 10 for big moments. So in total, the book gets a 48 out of 50. So that brings us to my favorite book in the series and the only one I haven't talked about so far. So The Shadow Rising is an absolute masterpiece of fantasy writing and one of the best fantasy books and one of the best fantasy books ever put to page in my opinion. The plots are unique, the world building is incredible, the characters are dynamic, and the big moments are big. It's really hard to top this book. For pacing, the book is perfect. Starting out in the Stone of Tear and establishing Rand as needing to grow, and it keeps us in suspense about his plans as he maneuvers the nobles and Tear. The entire plot line with Rodion and the Glass Columns is one of the best pieces of writing in literature as we gradually learn about the backstory of the Aiel. Perrin and the Two Rivers plotline leaves us just wanting more page after page to see what's going to happen and how it's going to be resolved. For pacing, it gets a 10 out of 10. As interest goes, this book is interesting from beginning to end. There's really no spot where it just lulls. The Two Rivers plotline is the best that we get of Perrin, in my opinion, in the entire series. As I've said, I love the glass columns from Roydeon and the scenes with the Aelfin and Elfin. The dynamic between Rand and Moraine is super interesting as Rand kind of evolves. The split of the White Tower and Nynaeve facing down Mogidian were awesome bits of writing to me as well. I couldn't put this book down. 10 out of 10. For character development, we, we see Perrin really become a great character here. He moves from just doing what needs to be done to leading an entire community. The dynamic between him and Fael becomes more real here, especially as she comforts him over the loss of his family. That relationship just adds more depth to me here in this book. Rand's story also is he becomes the Kar Karn and cements himself as the Dragon Reborn and the leader of the forces of light. It's also really cool to watch the way that Moraine adapts to her new role as she guides Rand and as he constantly rebuffs her. Nynaeve also realizes her power and overcomes her fear as she faces down and defeats Mogidian. 10 out of 10 for character development. For world building, this is an easy one. We not only get a full introduction to the Aiel, but also the history of the Aiel dating back all the way to the Age of Legends and the opening of the Boar into the Dark One's prison. We see the Aiel waste in all its glory. We get to see Tanchico and learn about Terabon and see a new city that we haven't seen before. We also get more depth in the Two Rivers as we revisited almost a year after our characters left. 
uh, at the beginning of the Eye of the World, and we get to learn more about the characters and the culture of that area as well. Easy 10 out of 10. Lastly, big moments and plot resolution. Well, we have a ton of big moments here. The glass columns, as I mentioned before, the battle of the two rivers, Nynaeve's showdown with Mogidian, Rand's battle with Asmodian over the Choden Call. The book is truly epic and gets a 10 out of 10 here as well. In total, The Shadow Rising earns a perfect 50 out of 50 from me and gets the top spot on my list, making it my clear favorite Wheel of Time book. So that's the end of my list. So the real question here is, is do you agree? I bet you that you don't. Please give me your top 15 books ranked in the comments below and tell me a bit about why you ranked them that way. If you are liking the content here, make sure to like, subscribe, and share the video. Also, if you are interested in seeing a bit more of the behind the scenes of how I make my videos, see my scripts, even get some kind of cool merch, all of that, make sure you check out my Patreon page. And a big shout out to everybody over on Patreon who is supporting what I do here at this channel. You guys are freaking awesome. Hey, but until next time, guys, take care. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do Mistress up above, slipping on a rope of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?